Hello, this video is about the circuit analysis of the oscillator used in guitar amplifier tremolo circuits. It's a very simple resistor capacitor phase shift oscillator. Despite its simplicity, the circuit analysis is somewhat rigorous. We will be doing a derivation of the equations for the oscillator frequency and the required gain of the amplifier. Right off the bat, let's set the record straight. There has been considerable confusion about the terms tremolo and vibrato over the years. Vibrato is a pulsating sound effect produced by slight and rapid changes in the pitch or frequency of a note. Tremolo is a trembling or shuddering effect produced by slight and rapid changes in the volume or amplitude of a note. Bottom line, tremolo is a change in volume and vibrato is a change in pitch. This video is about the circuit that sets the speed of the tremolo, which is the oscillator. Here's a clip of the oscillator schematic for a Fender Vibrolux Reverb chassis number AA964. Although this is a specific schematic, the same identical oscillator circuit was used in most Fender amplifiers back in the day of tubes. As a teenager working on guitar amplifiers, I was perplexed by looking at this schematic. I realized later on that it was a poorly drawn schematic in terms of being an intuitive representation of the circuit. Here's the schematic drawn in a more intuitive way without the speed control and the on-off control. There are three sets of successive resistor capacitor high-pass filters in a typical ladder topology. We know there is 180 degrees of phase shift in the tube. The RC network adds an additional 180 degrees of phase shift. The output of the network is fed back to the input of the amplifier, shifted by 360 degrees, which is in phase. This is how oscillation happens. Here's the redrawn schematic of the entire oscillator. One of the shunt resistances is made variable to adjust the speed or frequency of the oscillation. An on-off foot switch is used. With the switch in the closed position, the resistors are grounded for normal operation. When opened, the two shunt resistors are pulled to a 50 volt negative supply, which biases off the oscillator tube grid. The output goes to the grid of the tube that amplitude modulates the channel. The switch biases it off as well. The oscillator's output could be taken anywhere in the network. It just became convenient to use the other fixed resistor as an on-off bias control for the successive tube stage. The phase shift could have been accomplished with three low-pass sections, but the series capacitor act as DC blocks, so the implementation of the on-off control could be easily incorporated into the design. Let's look at the phase shift through one RC high-pass section. The transfer function is the resistive divider between the resistor and capacitor, which simplifies to this. The cutoff frequency is when the capacitive reactance equals the resistance. With a 0.01 microfarad capacitor, the resistor would need to be 1.59 megaohms for a cutoff frequency of 10 hertz. Here's the magnitude response. The minus 3 dB point is at 10 hertz, and the slope is 20 dB per decade. Here's the phase response. Notice as we go low in frequency, the phase shift is 90 degrees. So all we need to do is put two of these in series to get our desired 180 degrees of phase shift that we need. Wrong. Phase shift only approaches 90 degrees. The response is asymptotic, so it never really reaches 90 degrees. That's why three sections are required to get 180 degrees. Each contributes 60 degrees of phase shift. Let's do a quick control theory review of positive feedback and understand the criteria for the oscillation to occur. Here's a block diagram of a feedback control system. AV of S is the Laplace transform of the amplifier. Beta is the feedback network. 
the amount fed back to the summing junction of the input, which is beta, times the output voltage, VO. We can write the loop equations as shown. After rearranging to solve for the transfer function, the output over the input, we get this. The Barkhausen stability criterion dictates the condition at which oscillation occurs. The oscillation occurs when the denominator of the transfer function goes to zero, which blows up. Note that because of this, no input signal is needed. Just the startup of the power supply or noise will initiate the oscillation. So we can remove the input. Then rearranging the equation and replacing S with J omega, the oscillation occurs when the complex product of AV and beta is equal to 1. Separating the real and imaginary terms, the real must be 1 and the imaginary needs to be 0, or an integer multiple of 360 degrees phase shift that results in the imaginary part being 0. Equating the network's real term to 1 will yield the amplitude conditions to be met for oscillation. Equating the network's imaginary term to zero will yield the frequency of oscillation. Let's move on with doing the circuit analysis of the triple RC high pass network. But first, I made a pledge in these videos. No algebraic steps left behind. Here's the schematic of the three RC high pass sections in the latter topology. All resistors will be the same value, and all capacitors will be the same value. The first equation will be I3 equals VO divided by R. Then VB will have the voltage drop across C added to VO. Substituting VO over R in place of I3 and simplifying. Using KCL, we can say that I2 equals VB over R plus I3. Substituting the expressions for VB and I3. Now distributing VO over R. Then factor out VO over R. Then we can say VA equals I2 times 1 over SC plus VB. Substituting the expressions for I2 and VB. Distributing VO then distributing 1 over SC, then factor out VO and combine terms. Continuing, we can say I1 equals VA over R plus I2, then substituting the expressions above for VA and I2. Factor out VO over R. We can write VI equals VA plus I1 over SC. Now substituting the terms we have for VA and I1. I'll move that R over to the other side, then distribute 1 over SRC into the brackets, then combine terms. Finally, rearrange to solve for the transfer function V out over VN. It's necessary to separate the transfer function into its real and imaginary parts to apply the Barkhausen criteria, so we will substitute J omega for S. Recall that S is sigma plus J omega, where sigma is the real term and J omega is the imaginary term. For linear time invariant systems, sigma is zero, so we can just say S equals J omega. Substituting J omega for the three occurrences of S. I'll pull out the J terms and evaluate them to the things we know. J equals the square root of minus 1. Therefore, J squared equals minus 1. So this term becomes negative and the J squared goes away. J cubed equals J squared times J, which equals minus J. That makes this term negative and makes the J cubed go to J. Now I'm just moving the terms so the reals are together and the imaginary terms are together. Then factoring out J to get the real part versus the imaginary part. From the Barkhausen criterion, we know the frequency of oscillation 
is when the imaginary term is zero, which means the phase is 180 degrees. It becomes zero when these terms in the imaginary part are equal, so being subtracted from each other equals zero, rearranging to solve for omega naught. Then we can substitute 2 pi f naught for omega naught, and we get this very simple equation for the frequency of oscillation. All that math, and we come out with a capacitive reactance formula with the square root of 6 in it. Now for the other part of the Barkhausen criterion, the loop gain. Here's the real terms of the transfer function, which will represent the attenuation of the circuit. Substituting our equation for omega. Then the resistors and capacitors fall out. After further simplification, we see the attenuation is negative 1 over 29. Therefore, the minimum amplifier gain required to make the loop gain equal to 1 is minus 29. That would be 29.25 dB. I put the transfer function in Excel. The components I selected were for a 10 Hz oscillator, which is 0.01 microfarad capacitors and 650K resistors. Here's the magnitude response and the associated Excel transfer function formula. Notice the magnitude at 10 Hz is the minus 29.25 dB that we expected. Here's the phase plot. Since it's a three-pole network, as the frequency decreases, the phase wraps after 180 degrees. Think of the vector on the imaginary plane as it passes through 180 degrees and goes negative. Click the link above to check out the video on using Excel in the Laplace S domain. To have a practical tremolo effect, the frequency of the oscillator must be variable. You only need to vary one element in the network, and of course resistance is the easiest component to use as a variable device. Fender used a 3 mega ohm pot in series with a 100K resistor. Here's the simplified network with the reference designator R3 as variable. When the component values are non-uniform, this equation can be used to calculate the frequency based on unique values of all components. It's very nice to use a spreadsheet for such a calculation. By naming the cells by their reference designators, construction of the formula is a breeze. With R3 at the minimum value of 100K results in a frequency of 11.86 Hz. Let's talk about parasitics. Notice the network is driven by the tube amplifier, which has a non-negligible output impedance. It's a parallel combination of the internal plate resistance of the tube with the plate load resistor. In the case of the fender schematic with the 12AX7, its output impedance is around 36K. The effect of this will throw off the calculated frequency by a slight amount. The oscillator tube has a high gain of around 64. So the Miller capacitance at the input is about 110 picofarad, which is fairly negligible. When the 3 meg pot is maxed counterclockwise, R3 is 3.1 mega ohms and the frequency is 3.13 hertz. I plotted the oscillator frequency versus the varying resistance of R3, which is very nonlinear. It has a 1 over the square root of x shape. You may not have noticed, but in the Fender schematic, the 3 meg speed pot has the designator RA, which stands for reverse audio. A reverse audio, or sometimes called inverse log pot, is used to compensate for that nonlinearity as shown in green. Click the link above to watch the video on the audio taper potentiometer. The RC phase shift oscillator can be easily implemented with an op amp. The difference between it and the vacuum tube is the input impedance. The input impedance of the op amp in the inverting configuration is equal to the input resistor since there is a virtual ground at the inverting terminal. The input impedance in this case serves as the last shunt resistance of the RC ladder 
If I had used .01 capacitors and 1 meg resistors, I would have needed a 29 mega ohm feedback resistor to set a gain of 29. I scaled the components by a factor of 10. The frequency is still around 6.5 Hz. I set the maximum gain with a potentiometer to 30. The required gain for the Barkhausen criteria is 29. We will see in the lab the effects of the various gains. Here's the breadboard of the circuit. The 1 meg potentiometer is connected with clip leads. I powered the circuit on. Notice how the oscillation amplitude is slowly increasing. Each cycle of oscillation is experiencing successive gain until it settles. Notice the frequency is about 6.3 Hz. Now I'll adjust the gain to just below 29 with the pod. You can see the oscillation decay just as you would expect. But then I turn the gain back up to 30 and the oscillation does not occur. I must cycle power to get it to oscillate again. Then I change the gain to 40 by adding an additional 1 meg resistor in the feedback and it starts up immediately. Thanks for watching. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content.